Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ESSO Professional Development Series. We will be getting started in just a few minutes. We are going to give a couple more people time to sign on. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Bonsell from the Association of Food and Drug Officials, and we would like to thank you for joining us for the Active Professional Development Series. We are here today with Dr. Gibson to discuss the prevention and control of highly tra transmissible viruses in retail food service operations. Dr. Kristen Gibson is an Associate Professor in the Department of Food Science at the University of Arkansas. Her experience is primarily in the field of environmental science, sciences with a focus on microbial water quality and detection of viral pathogens in environmental matrices, including food, water, and air. Kristen's research, includes, Kristen's research, research interests are primarily focused on understanding the fate and transport of pathogens within the environment, optimization of methods for the detection of viral pathogens in food and water, and on environmental surfaces, and food safety at the retail and consumer level. We will be taking questions at the end, so please feel free to hold on to your questions or type them in the question box during the presentation, and we will read them out at the end. We will also be turning, we will also be opening up the phone lines so you can raise your hand if you have a question, and we will unmute you so you can ask your question yourself. Um, Dr. Gibson, over to you. Thanks, Amy. So this is something I've never done before, is given a webinar where I can see no one. So, it's, so I'm very excited, but also anxious about this, because I really like to interact with the people that I am talking to. And I will be the first to say that what I'm going to present to you today, several of you on this webinar may and probably do know more than I do. Um, but this is just kind of where I've been thinking in my head about um, what I currently know and work with um, viruses and then our situation right now as we are moving through this COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I will go ahead and get started. And when I approached this webinar, one of the questions I asked myself was, what does an enteric virus and a respiratory virus have in common, right? Like, I am a foodborne um, pathogen person. I look at enteric viruses that replicate in our gut, um, that cause, you know, the nasty symptoms of diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, and I'm going to try to tell you or show you how a lot of what we know about enteric viruses um, and their control in, in the environment and how we can prevent and control them is also applicable to respiratory viruses that are also highly transmissible. So, I'm going to start with just a few basics on virus structure and function, and then I'm going to talk about human noroviruses, um, which a lot of you probably already know about, some of the key characteristics, and then I'm going to talk about SARS-CoV-2, which is the causative agent of COVID-19, and I'm hoping that we will begin to see this connection of how these two viruses are actually quite similar, 
and how a lot of what we use um, as best practice for infection control in food service um, operations um, will also be applicable to um, control the spread of COVID-19 in um, these operations as well. So first off, so just a little primer on the structure and function of a virus, because I know a lot of people, they think about um, that bacteria way more, and sometimes it's hard to kind of grasp what is a virus. And so I show on my screen um, the one with the spiky um, protrusions coming out. So that's our, our friend SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's a coronavirus, and that's it has these little spikes, and it makes it look like a crown um, when you look at it on an electron micrograph. Or And so I can show you a picture of that um, in a little bit. And then down um, below in blue is our good friend norovirus. So they are structured a little differently. Um, so viruses are small intracellular parasites that cannot reproduce by themselves. So they must have a host, which automatically makes it very different from bacteria. Uh, an infectious virus particle is called a virion. And this virion, it consists of a nucleic acid and an outer shell of protein that we call a capsid. And this virion may be enveloped or non-enveloped. And this is a, one of the key distinctions between these two viruses, uh, between respiratory viruses in general and then enteric viruses. And another thing is, most viral host ranges are narrow. Um, so with human norovirus, there are certain ones that only infect humans and ones that stick with their animal host. SARS-CoV-2 is just throwing a whole new thing into the mix, um, along with a lot of coronaviruses, where they do come from animal or origins and emerge into human populations, which I will show later as well. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the structure of a virus. So you have a nucleic acid, which is the DNA or RNA, um, some enzymes that are going to help it replicate in the host cell once it's at its site of infection, the protein capsid, and then you have this envelope that surrounds it if that's the type of virus it is. And so it is host derived, which means when the virus infects the host cell and replicates and then bursts out, it's going to take some of that um, cell material left over and make itself a nice little envelope. Um, this is basically a phospholipid layer that prevents the breakdown of that protein capsid. So a lot of, most all respiratory viruses are going to have this envelope. Almost no enteric viruses have this envelope. Right, okay. So I'm going to talk about human noroviruses now. And I was trying to think about the best way to approach this because I wanted to do kind of compare and contrast, but it was too much to put them both on one slide. So I'm going to try to go back and forth um, between human norovirus and SARS-CoV-2 um, as I move through the presentation. So um, with respect to the public health impact of human norovirus, it is the most common cause of acute um, gastroenteritis worldwide. And in the U.S. alone, it causes 19 to 21 million illnesses. Um, and this was 78% um, of all cases with a known cause in 2009-2010. And with respect to food, it accounts for over 50% of foodborne illnesses. So it actually causes, of the, of the 21 million illnesses each year in the U.S., 25% of those are estimated to be foodborne. Um, and the majority of that is a, is a food handling issue, although there's a lot of unknown with respect to pre-harvest contamination, but we're not going to get into that today. So for all intents and purposes, food handling and... Uh, practices in food service operations are generally going to be um, the majority of um, human norovirus illnesses. Um, a lot of the morbidity and mortality of human norovirus, so the, the impact, the greatest impact is going to be on our very young and elderly populations. Um, and there are numerus modes of transmission, so um, person to person, contaminated surfaces, so indirect contact, um, direct contact, uh, consumption of contaminated foods, 
So lots of ways we can be exposed to human noroviruses. Um, and you might be thinking, well, why don't we do more about this virus? Clearly it has a huge public health impact. Um, but one of the key reasons why is that it doesn't have a high mortality rate. I'm not saying that the, the estimated 900 people that die because of norovirus each year is not important because it is, but it just doesn't have that impact um, like we're seeing with say, these respiratory viruses that cause hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, so most recently, um, the estimates are 900 deaths per year due to norovirus, 110,000 hospitalizations, 470,000 ER visits, 2.3 million kind of ambulatory care. So when you go to your urgent care place, those type of visits are happening due to norovirus infections. And an overall healthcare cost of 430 to $740 billion per year. So it's clearly an important um, pathogen um, with a big impact on public health. So the structure of human norovirus, and this will be important when we talk about SARS, is that it's a single-stranded RNA virus and it's non-enveloped, like I indicated before. Single-stranded RNA viruses are susceptible to um, what they call recombination or changing their genetic um, sequence. Um, and this can help them to continue to infect populations year after year because they're changing little bits of their um, D, uh, their RNA um, to kind of make it uh, look a little different to the host when it enters the, the host. Um, it's highly diverse, so there's lots of different um, genome groups and genotypes, and there are three major genome groups that infect humans. So I'm going to show you this, but I am not going to go through it um, in detail, but just to show you kind of the diversity of this virus, and this particular one, genogroup 2.4, does cause 72%, 75% of all illnesses. And it is what we call the endemic strain of human norovirus. So it circulates every year. And every so often, we get a new one that comes around due to that genetic recombination that I was talking about. And you'll get an, a spike in norovirus cases. Um, and interestingly, that usually comes or we have an idea that it's coming because of what's happening in Asia or Australia, right? So similar to influenza, how we know what's coming down the pike, um, norovirus kind of goes that same route where we can kind of see what's going to happen based on what's going on um, in these other countries first. <clears throat> so the clinical symptoms of norovirus. So clearly very different, you would suspect, than um, SARS-CoV-2. So it is a enteric virus. It's going to cause those enteric symptoms. The incubation period is so short, 12 to 48 hours. So we're not waiting to find out if someone's exposed, right? Like usually if you start seeing people with these symptoms, you're going to know in two days whether other people have been exposed. Um, it is self-limiting. Um, you know, there's not a lot you can do for a viral infection aside from like prophylactic care, hydrating. Um, most complications do involve dehydration, which is usually what happens in our elderly populations or our younger populations. Um, it does cause chronic infections and immunocompromise um, in physically stressed individuals. And an important aspect of norovirus which parallels um, SARS-CoV-2, is that up to 30% of infections, um, they may not show any symptoms at all, right? So it's these asymptomatic people that we just don't know about, right? And we're like, we can't control them, right? We just only hope everyone uses good hygiene practices all the time. Um, and another number I'm throwing up on the screen here is something I don't normally do, but in the media these days, we there's so much talked about this R naught or basic reproductive number of the virus. And so this basic reproductive number for norovirus um, was based on an outbreak in a summer summer camp scenario, but would be similar to what you would see um, in spread in a cruise ship environment or a conference. And the R naught for norovirus was estimated to be 2.62. So that means for each person that was infected they spread it to about 2.6 people. 
right? And so when we talk about SARS, you'll see the R not for that is similar, but there is a range, right? We don't have a good grasp on it yet. So these are what I call highly transmissible. Um, they can certainly be spread readily to other people and that contection can keep going on until we break that chain, um, which is the goal, right? So some common mis misnomers for human norovirus. This is when if I was in front of an audience, I would ask you, have you had the stomach flu? And most people will say, oh, absolutely. I it was awful. And then I'll be like, well, have you had norovirus? Well, I don't know. Well, if you've had the stomach flu, you've likely had a viral infection and you likely had norovirus just based on the numbers. Um, so it is commonly referred to as a stomach flu, 24 hour flu, less commonly winter vomiting disease, cruise ship virus. And this is because it does have a seasonal component, just like the flu, just like respiratory viruses. You see a spike in the winter months. And like the flu, it does have a rapid onset. So that really quick incubation period. <clears throat> so this is a graphic of the pattern, the seasonal pattern of norovirus. And so what you'll see is that the gray shaded area is the range um, over a six year period, 2012 to 2018. So the pattern stays steady for the most part. And then you'll see the dotted line or the dashed line is 2018 to 2019 last year. Similar patterns, so you see an uptick around Thanksgiving. And then as you move into the spring, we, we get some relief from norovirus. Um, this year, I love this graph. And I'm sorry that I'm, I'm really geeking out about this because you'll see here that there was a huge drop in reported norovirus outbreaks right when we had shelter in place orders happening across the United States. Um, this could be literally due to not being able to go out to eat. Um, and so reducing your chance of exposure to human norovirus. It could be due to not going to the doctor because you're not sick enough and it won't be reported that way. Um, so this has been a really unusual human norovirus season. And I just thought it was pretty amazing that you could see this true impact of having this kind of shutdown, lockdown type um, environment and the impact it has on this type of infectious disease transmission for sure. Um, one thing I am interested in, though, is this, this you know, increase in delivery services um, and if we're just having a true underreporting or if it's actually a true reduction. So um, this is just showing the seasonal pattern of human norovirus. So transmission. <clears throat> so the key characteristics to transmission for human norovirus are going to be almost parallel with SARS-CoV-2. So some key characteristics are its low infectious dose. So as you can see on the graphic, in the graphic on the right side of your screen, um, a very small amount, as few as 18 viral particles can make you sick. Um, this is based on volunteer studies that when they're drinking water. And, and so 18 particles is an estimate, you know, I would say the range has been reported 18 to maybe 1,000. The point is, though, these particles are so, so, so very small, the amount of viruses that could fit on the head of a pin would be enough to infect more than a thousand people. So this low infectious dose combined, combined with high shedding concentrations make it very easily spread. So when I say high shedding concentrations, we're talking about maybe 100,000 viral particles in a milliliter of a liquid. It could be, I could be talking about vomit or I could be talking about diarrhea, um, depending on the stage of illness you're at. 100,000 up to 1 billion in a mil, in a gram. This is something that, you know, even if you wash your hands and clean to the best of your ability, even a fraction of that remaining on a surface is enough to cause. Um, an illness. The other aspect of human norovirus 
is that it shed for a really long time um, after symptoms have subsided. So, um, and it also can be shed prior to um, being symptomatic, but it's the long-term shedding that is problematic. So it could be shed up to eight weeks after your symptoms stop. And so when we think about self-isolating and exclusion until you're done shedding, well, that's not really a possibility for human norovirus. Um, you're not gonna stay in your house for eight weeks. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe you can just avoid shaking hands or, or preparing food, but it's just not realistic. And so that is a way this virus is able to continue to spread to other people. Genetic diversity plays a role. Um, so you could be exposed to that endemic strain of human norovirus, genogroup 2.4. Last week, you know, you had a terrible bout of it, and then this week you're exposed to junior group 1.1, and you get it again. Because it is that different, your body is not going to have any immunity um, to that other type of norovirus. <clears throat> it is highly environmentally stable. Um, it can survive for weeks on surfaces, months in water, depending on the water type, depending on temperature, all these things. So highly environmentally stable. Um, those that are in the food industry, and you know this virus is um, highly resistant to common disinfectants, so your only weapon against this virus is bleach um, or sodium hypochlorite, so um, chlorine products at very high concentrations for the right amount of time of contact. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more later on cleaning and disinfection. Um, the other aspect of norovirus is that it is shed through vomiting. And a lot of people don't realize this. And so say you did have an incident in a restroom, um, someone vomited in the toilet. These um, droplets or aerosolized droplets can distribute into that entire washroom area very easily. And then your surfaces become contaminated and become a point of transmission as well. Um, and so this idea of being able to transmit in all these multiple routes is the key to this virus. All right, so where do these outbreaks actually happen? Um, restaurants are the majority of these outbreaks. Um, I already showed um, an onset of the month, but you can see foodborne does increase slightly with the endemic, the regular person-to-person -person transmission of um, norovirus each year. But one of the things I like to show as well is these are the common norovirus breeding grounds. It is a foodborne illness, but it is highly contagious and easily spread in crowded areas like this. Hospitals, schools, long-term care facilities, cruise ships, resorts, daycare centers. This should be very familiar to where we are right now with how we're trying to control for the spread of COVID-19. Um, with respect to nursing homes, the norovirus um, outbreaks reported are 50 to 60% coming from nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Eight to 14% come from schools. So right now we're in a situation where at least most schools are closed we're having these huge infection control issues in long-term care facilities, and there has been guidance for controlling for um, human norovirus in these types of um, facilities for several years. And so it should be interesting to look and see if those guidance and, and recommendations are actually, um, those that are following them are aiding in control of um, respiratory viruses as well in those facilities. Okay. Switching gears. So basically, I'm going to talk about SARS-CoV-2 um, in the same way I just talked about human norovirus. So public health impact, um, structure, all of those things, and hopefully some common themes will start to jump out to everyone. So we know it is the causative agent of COVID-19, which stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. It is the third coronavirus to jump from animal to human. So back in 2002, 2003, we had the first SARS epidemic. So it wasn't a pandemic, it was an epidemic because it really was contained in Asia, um, China. And then we had Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. And that was, as the name implies, 
very much contained in that region. Um, and now we have SARS-CoV-2, which has become this, this pandemic that we know right now. And so as of last night, when I looked at the data, there had been 1.55 million confirmed cases in the US, just the US. Worldwide, I think it was 5 million or close to, or over, I can't remember. And then we've also had um, 93,439 deaths due to COVID-19 in the US. As we know or get to learn about this virus and people have looked at case studies of patients and, and such, we know the majority of mortality are in the older population and those with comorbidities. So they have found that people with diabetes, people with um, that struggle with um, weight, so obese populations, high blood pressure, um, smokers, all of these things are, are being discovered as comorbidities for having severe outcomes due to um, infection with um, SARS-CoV-2. So here is our coronavirus that I was telling you about, this electron micrograph. And so the spikes you can see here, and this is called coronavirus because it does have this crown-like appearance. So the structure of SARS-CoV-2 is similar to norovirus. It is a single-stranded RNA virus. So that genetic recombination is coming into play here, and that is what allows it to eventually make that jump from an animal to a human host. Um, but it is enveloped. And this is actually on our side. Enveloped viruses are a little more susceptible and easier to control on environmental surfaces because they, um, there are more chemicals that can be used against them and they don't persist for quite as long. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is also in this genus beta coronavirus. That is not necessarily important, only that this is where all the highly pathogenic coronaviruses reside. And so the next slide I'm gonna show you is meant to just kind of give you a picture of where these highly pathogenic ones, which are highlighted in yellow, are coming from. And so if you've been reading the news like everyone else, um, bats seem to be the, um, the reservoir. And then there is thought that there's these intermediate hosts, animal hosts that are transmitting eventually to humans. Um, and so with the original SARS um, coronavirus, which is the top one, it was thought to be um, from bat to a uh, civet cat. Um, and then on to SARS coronavirus. Uh, the MERS coronavirus was linked to an uh, intermediate host of a camel. Um, they're still not sure about SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I will make note that some of these other coronaviruses here, so human coronavirus 229E, human coronavirus OC43 and NL63, these are all endemic human coronaviruses. You've probably had them. They're, they kind of have symptoms like the common cold like a rhinovirus or something. So these are something that circulate in the population all the time. So it's really interesting how you get these um, highly pathogenic forms of coronavirus emerge into the population. It seems like every, you know, 10 or 15 years or so. <clears throat> all right, so the basics for um, clinical symptoms. Um, I saw a range, and I was a little surprised, I didn't know this range had changed on the CDC last night, but two to 14 day incubation period. So I hadn't really seen the short incubation period of two days, um, but the 14 day incubation period makes it really difficult to control some things like this because you don't know if you have it yet or you're not sure. Um, and so it can't be kind of caught and stopped quickly. Um, which is why we're all sheltering in place right now. <laughs> um, so we know the symptoms are cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, fever, chills, muscle pain, all the things you would associate with like the flu, but it's not the flu, it's different, right? Um, but it's these symptoms are, are very similar. And so it makes things super difficult when you're in the midst of flu season, and then you have another respiratory virus that presents similarly, but with some differences. Um, one of the things I want to point out on here is that less common symptoms, though they have been reported, I would say, I know this is an oxymoron, frequently, <laughs> are GI symptoms. 
Um, so there were some case studies out of China that showed, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the people presenting at the hospital had GI symptoms, diarrhea, or nausea. And so it makes you wonder about the role of that because SARS-CoV-2 has been um, found to actively replicate in our GI tract. What does that mean for transmission? Um, I don't know. And it's one of the things that needs to be investigated. Um, but clearly, the major mode of transmission is person to person and respiratory droplets um, person to person. So this um, quote here is Dr. Anthony Fauci saying that um, maybe 50% of total infections are asymptomatic. And that is coming to light. And I think that is probably an accurate number. I've seen 30% to 50%. So here again, we are with these asymptomatic infections that are so hard to control because they don't know they're infected and they don't know they're spreading. And again, I have the r not number that has been reported for SARS. I put a a little squiggly to approximate because I've seen between 2.5 to 5. Um, and so 3, I think, is what's quoted the most. And so again, if you're infected, you probably could pass it to three people, and those three people will pass it to nine people, and so on. So we have similarities there, asymptomatic similarities, GI symptoms, and the ability to pass to a fair number of people once you're infected. So, transmission of SARS. This is where the key characteristics are almost identical to human norovirus. So low infectious dose, um, while they haven't determined the infectious dose of SARS-CoV-2, SARS, the original SARS coronavirus, was reported to have an infectious dose of 16 to 160 virus particles. So right in line with um, some of the enteric viruses. And it has high shedding concentrations. So a recent study um, showed that 1 billion viruses could be detected in a single throat swab. Um, this virus is very different, and you may be wondering, well, why didn't the other SARS coronavirus cause so many issues? Well, it's because the, the throat swab I just told you about, the one billion virus particles on there, um, similar, similar stuff that was done with SARS coronavirus, their, um, the original one had 1,000 times less viruses, right? So. SARS-CoV-2 has 1,000 times more viruses present in a single throat swab than the original SARS coronavirus. So this is aiding its ability to have a high basic reproductive number. Um, prolonged shedding, and so they've shown that people can continue to have um, SARS-CoV-2 in their system, um, replicating for you know, 28 days or so after, like from after symptoms starting or through their, you know, so after the symptoms start subsiding, people are often quarantined until they are no longer shedding that virus. So they may not have symptoms, but they're still shedding that virus. Um, and so the virus does shed for um, longer than symptoms last. Environmentally, environmental stability. So this is where there is a difference. Um, studies have shown, so some people have done systematic reviews of um, previous highly pathogenic coronaviruses and regular, the regular coronaviruses I was talking about that cause the common cold. Um, they can remain on various, in various environments, so on various surfaces, um, for five minutes to nine days. And it all depends on a lot of different factors. Um, the amount of virus that actually ends up on that surface. So the more virus that ends up on the surface makes sense, right? The longer you're gonna detect it because the more virus you have that'll die off over time, then you'll still be able to detect it. So if you have a lower virus concentration that ends up on a surface, you won't be able to detect it for a longer period of time because that virus is gonna continue to die off. There's also an idea that viruses that uh, you have a higher concentration, they do what you call, they kind of group together or aggregate and then they end up protecting 
um, the other viruses from the stresses of the environment that they're in. So drying out. Um, so one of the things about um, SARS-CoV-2 is that it has that envelope and that envelope is a lipid and it is susceptible to drying out. Um, so that's one of the things um, with respiratory viruses, it has that um, susceptibility to desiccation, which enteric viruses don't really um, show the same patterns. Um, shedding through respiratory droplets, so that's different than norovirus. It's not a respiratory droplet, but it's an aerosolized vomit, which is almost, <laughs> to me, is almost worse. Um, but you have that huge difference there. But then I question Mark feces, like I said, because there have been reports. And this is something that was reported in the original SARS as well as MERS. They have shown the presence of these viruses in feces. And so the question is, what is the role of um, fecal respiratory transmission um, with respect to um, SARS-CoV-2? And so this graphic is showing a lot of the different um, transmission routes that I've been kind of talking about. And so you have the basic direct, you know, infected person droplets. And so this is showing larger droplets versus smaller droplets. Um, and then that person either, you know, shaking someone's hand, direct contact, droplets to another person, a susceptible host. Here, they're actually showing what I'm talking about. What about this toilet scenario and the droplets and all of this? Where does that come into role? And then you also have the indirect contact with environmental surfaces, which I think is a key to um, the control within um, food service operations. So at this time, I want to show um, a video. So if you want to turn on your computer audio, I'm going to show a video. Um, I like these videos of a sneeze. So you can kind of see like what happens during a sneeze. Um, and then I'm also going to show fluid fragmentation from so what we call the toilet flush plume um and and so you can see like this is a this is a legitimate concern so let's see so there is no sound on this one sorry you don't really have to turn on your audio I would highly recommend going to um, this site, uh, the Baruba Group, which is on, she's at MIT, and she has lots of amazing videos. So, and this isn't supposed to have sound, sorry, um, that show you how these particles move, how droplets of water aerosolize in the different particles. So. Um, okay. And then the next one, sorry, I'm not used to using this, so you'll have to bear with me. And the next one I want to show is the, the toilet flush plume. And I'm actually going to fast forward through some of the, um, the video. Sorry, it's not letting me um, fast forward through it. So I am um, hopefully we will get to the toilet flush plume soon. Um, bear with me. <laughs> okay, so this is where you'll start to see it. And I'm not going to show the whole video. I just want to give an example. Um, so they're showing kind of how these water particles move in the air and you have like these the bigger lines of movement and then these smaller droplets that are coming off. Okay, this has been shown um, other times in other ways, but I think it's really relevant here for both human norovirus and SARS-CoV-2 until we understand that role of fecal-oral um, transmission in this virus. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video. Um, but like I said, go to the group's website and you'll um, be able to see more.
Okay, I did it. Excellent. Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay, so this should look familiar. We're talking about common breeding grounds for norovirus. Well, the same are common breeding grounds for COVID-19. Um, and so thinking about how to um, move forward. So to wrap up this one part, and I'm probably going to go for 10 more minutes. I think I was supposed to be done in, in five minutes, but I just don't think it's going to happen. So, um, so what are our common grounds? We have low infectious dose, high shedding concentrations, prolonged shedding, somewhat environmentally stable, exposure through aerosolization, though different um, bodily fluids we're talking about there, um, and then multiple routes of, of transmission. So fecal oral, fecal respiratory, what are the roles of that here? So what does all of this mean for retail food service operation? So this um, image is something that my student put together for a proposal we're working on right now, but it's showing kind of a scenario of what could happen in the front of the house of a restaurant, um, where SARS-CoV-2 could be located. So you have the direct transmission of the um, droplets, and then you have surface contamination and transfer from the surface to a hand. You have a server component. So, so what does this mean? How do we understand indirect contact transmission of COVID-19, which I think is going to be, um, so aside from the direct contact, right? We know about that. Don't go out, self-isolate if you have symptoms, but I know we still have those asymptomatic people, but we're talking about indirect contact transmission right now. So um, first, the virus must be introduced into the environment. So say you do have that asymptomatic that comes in. Okay, they're gonna introduce the environment, uh, the virus to the environment. All right, now the virus has to be able to survive on surfaces. It depends on the surface, the concentration of the virus, like I indicated before, on how long they're actually gonna be able to survive. And then that virus has to be transferred from the surface to hands at a greater concentration than the dose that is required to make you sick, right? So we talked about you could have, if you're actively symptomatic, a billion viruses um, from a single throat swab, and then it only takes 16 to 160 to cause infection. Um, clearly, there is a wide range there, but there is enough of that range to say it can be transmitted and spread in this scenario. And then to initiate infection, you have to self-inoculate. So you have to have your hands contaminated and self-inoculate by touching your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. <clears throat> So this is the type of guidance that's been released. I've been looking at it a lot because I'm trying to figure out what's going on um, and trying to put together a proposal to help address some of these questions. Environmental cleaning and hygiene have been critical to control of viruses and this virus in speci um, specifically. And so what I found is that a lot of what we do for prevention and control of uh, norovirus are essentially being applied for COVID-19 in a way. Uh, clearly, there are going to be differences, but uh, there's a lot of parallels. Um, there's a lot of guidance and recommendations being released by FDA, CDC, and US EPA, and each agency is referring to the other um, for additional guidance. So there's so much information out there, it's overwhelming. And so I'm just going to say, okay, what do we do for human norovirus? Well, these should all look very similar to what we're talking about doing for SARS-CoV-2. Um, SARS Hand hygiene. So there, there was a huge boom on alcohol-based hand antiseptics. Um, so they are not a replacement for hand washing, but they could be a nice interim. But hand washing clearly is going to be the best thing you can do. Um, and then also personal protective equipment if you are in a situation where you're having to clean up um, an incident where um, someone, uh, like a bathroom where you know someone vomited or had diarrhea and you're not really sure, right? So PPE is important. Cleaning and disinfecting. So we know that you have to use the appropriate sanitizers and disinfectants. So concentration and contact time, which I think is something that isn't talked about enough because if you don't have that, then it doesn't matter what you do, um, it's not gonna work. So if you're not doing what's prescribed on the label, it's not gonna work the way it's claiming to work. There's also different tools for applying um, for application and cleaning. So sprays, foams, impregnated wipes, 
Um, you, uh, and so wipes are something everyone's like, disinfect, wipe this down. What does that mean exactly? What is on this impregnated wipe that I should be wiping down? And how long is it the, the physical act of wiping or is it the actual chemical in that wipe that's gonna contact that object long enough to inactivate that virus? <clears throat> and then also, um, what are we using to apply these chemicals? And so I'm gonna show you two sets of data from my lab um, over the past few years. Um, so proper hygiene is something that's talked, talked about a lot. And so this is a common thing in, thing in uh, virus prevention and control. So we had two studies that were done. Um, one looked at the impact of soap types, so foaming versus gel based on hand washing time. This may seem like a minor thing, but I thought of this because I kept going to places and there were foaming dispensers, dispensing all different volumes of soap, and then there were gel based soap dispensers. And I was like, I clearly wasn't washing my hands uh, quite as well <laughs> when I was using certain types of soap. Um, not to be biased, but I wanted to know, like, is this, is this just me or is this a thing? Um, and so while we didn't show a statistically significant difference because of the variation, um, there was a five six second difference in um, time spent hand washing um, combined hand washing and rinsing time. So people did five seconds longer of hand washing using gel based soaps than foaming. And so when we're talking about changing behaviors and, and getting people to do 20 seconds of hand washing, maybe we should consider the tools that we're giving them to do that and how those tools will impact their behavior of hand washing. Um, more work needs to be done on this, but I still think it's something that um, is important to consider. And then the other thing we did was we looked at um, the plain soap types with respect to bacteria and virus removal on hands. So this is what we saw. And overall, you'll just see MS2 is our, our virus uh, surrogate. So it's a bacteriophage. It's a virus that infects bacteria. They are never going to let us put a human norovirus on someone's hands. So this is what we got. Um, but what you can see is that there was a clear, not statistically significant in all cases, but clear difference between the removal of a virus versus the removal of a bacteria um, and then the soap type. So um, while there wasn't a difference between foaming and liquid for MS2, clearly soap is playing a role in the removal when you just compare it to washing with water, right? Um, so what about enveloped virus? What do we know about that? So the only thing I could find was a study that was done related to Ebola virus. And so Ebola virus, the bloodborne virus, it's an enveloped virus. Um, and they used an organism, another bacteriophage, and it was really unique because it has an envelope and most bacteriophage don't. And so this was like a, a big thing, like maybe we can use this as a, what you call a surrogate virus or a virus that will help us study these organisms that we cannot put on people's hands. And what they showed is that um, you were able to get a 99.9% .9 reduction uh, or so of this organism um, using soap and water, right? And so it, we've been told to wash our hands with envelope viruses and that's because the soap you know, it's going to break down that lipid envelope, that fatty layer, and then it's, it'll cause the virus to um, be inactivated. So we know that, but one of the things missing in this study was the actual use of um, soaps that are used in uh, food service operations. They only use like a bar of soap, right? They didn't use these different types of soap dispensers. And then there's all sorts of different types of um, hand antiseptics that that have different formulations. And so I think this is work that needs to be done. With respect to cleaning and disinfecting, one of the questions we have is how do you clean and disinfect upholstery and carpet? You know, we're talking about norovirus needs bleach. We can't put bleach on carpet. Um, so they, there's been several studies on various methods for that. What about multi-user touchscreen devices? Uh, what role are those going to play as we move into this kind of new world of trying to control um, COVID-19 spread? So you're talking about the touchscreen devices you use to order things, you're signing for things, you're doing all these things that everyone else is touching at the same time. Um, are the tools we use um, to clean adding to the spread? And so um, in the sake of time, I, um, this is a study we did on cleaning costs. And I want to say that 
we, and I think Amy's going to share this uh, PowerPoint so you can look at it more closely, but we were wondering about virus removal versus virus transfer. And so we did see removal of viruses using these coughs. It didn't have any disinfectant. We just want to know what the cloth was doing, um, where you could remove, you know, about 700 viruses from a surface, a solid surface to 1400 viruses from a stainless steel surface using across all cloths. Um, and then this is showing transfer. So the key here is that there was a two log difference in virus transfer between uh, the cellulose cotton, uh, cotton cloth versus the terry towel cloth, which is often used in food service operations. So maybe we really need to be looking at the tools that we're, we're trying to use to implement environmental cleaning practices. So here are the gaps that I find that are remaining. And maybe you guys have some answer to these. What what is the role of this fecal transmission route? Um, surface to hands and back again, right? There is very little information on the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 from surfaces to hands. How frequently are hands becoming contaminated? What is the viral load on hands? You know, what, what is the real risk here? Um, the other aspect is the FDA food code and respiratory viruses. So the food code really focuses on the back of the house, there's some on the front of the house, just clean as needed. Um, it's designed to prevent foodborne illnesses, not respiratory viruses. Um, and it only requires food contact surfaces to be cleaned and sanitized. Non-food co contact surfaces only need to be cleaned. What does that mean? Um, they've issued guidance that when the food code doesn't have anything really about disinfecting, disinfecting in it, you know, how do you proceed with making a plan? Um, there is a US EPA in list, which is a list of disinfectants, 392 disinfectants against SARS-CoV-2, but they haven't been confirmed. They're just on the list. Disinfecting wipes top this list. How do these wipes actually inactivate and get rid of SARS-CoV-2 on surfaces? And then the last question is, how often is frequent cleaning and disinfecting needed? What is frequent? So we need to validate um, environmental cleaning effectiveness um, and the frequency that is needed in order to begin to, to seriously reopen um, our economy and our food service industry. And so with that, wash your hands. I'm very sorry for going over. I get excited and then I lose track of time. So any questions? Um, I think Amy or Christina, whoever's on here is gonna field them, so. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. That was a very fascinating, um presentation and you can definitely tell the passion in your voice when you're talking about it. We do actually have some um, existing questions, so I will start with those. Um, we are going to open the phone lines as well, so if you would like to ask your question yourself, go ahead and um, raise your hand and we will jump over there. And um, as Dr. Gibson mentioned, the recording for this webinar and the slides will be available on the Active Professional Development webpage, I would say probably Tuesday. All right, so the first question would be, where did the virus originate from if they cannot be active outside of the host cell? And this question came through when you were talking about the norovirus. Oh, so what it means is that, so we, we are the reservoir, right? So humans, we're the only reservoir of human noroviruses. And so what happens is we shed this virus um, and you may, be like, oh gosh, this is going to be gross. But you know, there are some places that don't treat their wastewater, and the environment does get the um, wastewater does go into the environment, and so the virus is able to survive in the environment for periods of time and until it finds its next host, and then it replicates and more is out there. Um, wastewater treatment plants do a decent job, but they have shown that they actually don't um, get rid of all viruses during wastewater treatment process, and wastewater treatment is designed to remove bacteria, fecal bacteria, and nutrients. It is not designed for the removal of viruses. That is how it's able to then go into the environment at a level that you could then come in contact with as a susceptible host or person. Great, thank you. All right, the next question is, Harvard slash Boston Physicians puts the RN naught at five at six and suspected that one person infects 50 or more. Data shared in March 2020. Any thoughts on this? 
I don't have any thoughts because <laughs> there is a range, um, like I indicated. And so they have, the range has been from 2.5 all the way up to five or six. Um, the range is because people are looking at very specific scenarios or outbreak um, settings or clusters. And so some clusters can have an R naught that is much higher than others. Um, and so right now the 2.6 is kind of, even with what we're doing as, as a society limiting contact, you have that R naught of 2.6. Um, so I think it's just really depends on the scenario and how people are determining it based on that specific outbreak cluster. Great, thank you. Let's move over to the phone lines. Um, Sarah, I see that you have your hand raised. I'm going to unmute you. Please unmute yourself and then you can ask your question. Sarah, you should be able to speak now. Okay, that doesn't seem to be working. Um, we will move down to Alan. Um, Alan, you have your hand raised. I'm going to unmute you. Please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Alan, you should be able to speak now. Uh, yeah, um, I work for the Florida Department of Health. I have a question here about the use of bleach, especially in high concentrations. Uh, the EPA itself has actually discouraged people from using bleach sometimes. And what about the uh, concern of the vapor is coming off the bleach? Sure. So, I mean, with SARS-CoV-2, doesn't require that high concentration of bleach that norovirus requires. So studies have shown that, you know, even like 0.1% bleach is enough to cause a 99.9% .9 reduction of the virus. I think what people really need to do before saying, I'm just going to pour all this bleach in here or not really paying attention to the preparation, which is where you could get those vapors, is to read the instructions and use the appropriate concentration. Um, and that's where we need, I think, better guidance for consumers to say, and I think it's out there, it's just how do they find it, um, how to prepare the solution appropriately um, for your what you're trying to do. So um, clearly there was some stuff that happened, some things were said and people started doing um, certain behaviors like swallowing chemicals and stuff and that was not what was supposed to happen. So yes, bleach is always something that is a problem. Good thing with SARS is that there are other chemicals that are less caustic that will inactivate the virus on surfaces. So. Great. Thank you for your answer. Um, we have another question and um, now that everyone knows how to wash their hands and why it is important, do you think that we might see a reduction in norovirus and other foodborne illnesses? <laughs> I really hope so. I hope this isn't a um, kind of a little blip and then people go back to their normal practices. Um, you know, doing what I do, I've always been really um, neurotic, I think is the right word, about washing my hands. And so kind of to see this grocery store run on soap <laughs> and other things, and all of a sudden we have to start washing your hands. It's like, why haven't we been washing our hands all along? So I hope that during this, this period of time, people are developing these permanent behavior changes. And so absolutely, like maybe we will. There are so many kind of long standing impacts um, that could happen based on this um, COVID-19 and kind of this increased awareness that could have, you know, long standing impacts on other infectious disease transmission, absolutely. I think it would be very interesting to see the data um, as we move through the next year or two. So. I have to agree. I am also a neurotic hand washer, so I am hoping the same. Um, our next question is, are physical barriers effective instead of distance? Example, plexiglass installed floor to six foot high between booths instead of a six foot separation and loss of dining space. I actually don't really know the answer to that. I'm not going to claim to. Um, 
I would say the plexiglass is going to be an additional surface that needs to be appropriately environmentally cleaned. Um, so you would have to have proper operational procedures for doing that, cleaned and sanitized in between guests. Um, as far as virus removal, um, moving over plexiglass that high, I have no idea. Um, I think there was a study out of China that did show, you know, the HVAC system playing a role in virus spread in a restaurant. So that's certainly something to consider, um, you know, before before people really open things up anyways. So, yeah, I can't really answer that question except plexiglass is going to be another surface to um, clean and sanitize or disinfect. All right, thank you. We actually do have a few more questions. Do you have some time to hang around and answer them? Sure, I can, I can hang around for a few more minutes, yep. Awesome, all right. Do you have any information about quaternary sanitizer of 200 to 400 ppm being effective for non-food contact surfaces to kill COVID-19? Um, there is a, oh, I can look for it super quick. Um, <laughs> there is a review paper that looked at a bunch of um, different sanitizing agents and they have shown that quats and, and the concentration is unclear. So I can't, I can't really answer that, but I do know that quats have been shown to be effective against um, coronaviruses and enveloped viruses in general on um, food content or not or any surface environmental surfaces in general um, non porous surfaces so great all right could someone become a carrier of norovirus you mentioned the shedding for a long term after symptoms are resolved <laughs> so um, like a typhoid Mary of norovirus yes <laughs> so that happens sometimes in immunocompromised populations um, so I don't know, I, my most analogous, uh, analogous situation would be um, those with HIV AIDS can be um, chronic shedders of cryptosporidium. Uh, it's because their body can't fight that off and they're just, they're constantly just being re replicating in their body and it's not, a, I don't, obviously it's not a fun thing, but yeah, so you have immunocompromised people that can become chronic shedders, absolutely. And we have one more question that we will take today. Um, did you say that there are indications that COVID can be passed via fecal oral when a toilet is flushed? I asked because I was told that stomach acids deactivate the virus. So I don't, I actually don't know for sure, but this is what I have, this is the most recent knowledge or data that I've seen. So there have, so SARS-CoV-2, the virus has been, was detected in stool samples using molecular techniques. So that, what that means is that it's only detecting the RNA, the, the genomic material. It didn't say whether it was infectious or not. So it was like, okay, so there's RNA there. Like, what does that mean? So this other group recently tested this out. And so there's a, there's a model system called, uh, it's like a, a a small, it's like a mini gut, that's what I want to call it. It's basically like a small version of your intestines in a petri dish. And it has all the cells that you would you would have and they're expressing all of the receptors that viruses recognize. And so they wanted to finally answer, does SARS-CoV-2 actually actively replicate in the gut? The answer is yes, um, it does. And so the thought is the RNA that's detected um, in stool samples is actually from actively replicating virus. Um, the concentration is much, much lower um, than a respiratory secretion. So that's where the question comes in. Um, you know, how much virus is there? How much is getting on the surface after flushing a toilet? And then how much will be transferred to a person to cause infection? Those are still questions unanswered. But we do know the virus does replicate because the same receptor that it uses for the respiratory system is, is expressed in high numbers in your small intestine. 
great. Thank you so much for that answer. And that is all the time that we have today. Um, there are also a lot of comments in the question box about thanking you for the presentation and how great this presentation was. So I think the attendees speak for themselves when they say that this was a great presentation and we really appreciate it, Dr. Gibson. Thank you, Amy. And I really appreciate the audience. This was a lot of um, fun for me. I love doing stuff like this. So thanks. Great. Thank you so much. And we hope you all have a fantastic weekend.